15. When did I write this? Frank? Who's this? Who, did you have a copy that's addressed to Frank, Jerry? Who gave this to Frank, Jerry? Uh, I don't know. And how'd you get a copy? I don't know. Is it addressed to Frank Zappa? Or is it a joke? No, it's just... 1976. So this came out in 57. This is the fourth printing. Okay. This book was presented to Frank Zappa and Don Vliet, later known as Don Van Vliet and Captain Deepar, a year after it came out in 1958 by me, through my assistant, and alias Paul Buff. Paul Buff then arranged for Don and Frank to join him at PAL Studios. And PAL was the uh, rearrangement of the letters ALP. And ALP is half of Finning his Wake, the other half being HCE. These two people form the code word chapel for the intelligence network I worked out of in New York, out of uh, Paris. So the code was in the title, PAL Studios, and then we, uh, and it was just outside, uh, actually it was near here where I first encountered them. It may have been this place, which as you can see, eventually changed its name in honor of my initiation of Don and Frank here into Bob's Two. In other words, we, I had worked for the House of York. I come to America, which is the House of Lancaster, and we decided to uh, holeopathize the house of Lancaster and go to Lancaster, a place. And when we, uh, when I moved in here in 58 and would drop in here, eventually I, I acquired a bit of control over the local Grand Wazoo and acquired it for the house of Lancaster. And that's why the title means Bob's too. And House of York was Bob's and also the house of Lancaster, Bob's too. Bob's also possessive, right? So this is in, this place is very close if it wasn't the place. This name was put in years later. If this wasn't the place, it is very near to the place where I first encountered them in 58 and introduced them to the idea that the Hidden Persuaders was not the form of the media, but the content of the media, and that the satire of the content of the media was advertising. Actually, a manipian satire of the form of the media. So this book initiated Frank and Don into the concepts of the fact that advertising was the true art form and that if you were going to make music or sculpture, you had to reflect the brain police activities of advertising. That's why Frank later queried this situation, writing a song called, Who Are the Brain Police? And uh, so we're here coming back 40 years, be 38 years before 1998, when the X's come and Bob achieves his uh, maximum in communication skills. Um, 1958, 40 years before 1998. This is 1996. We're preparing and doing an X day drill here at Lancaster, where Bob first made his infiltration into the United States. And uh, Don and Frank were trained with this manual. This was the obverse of Marsh McLuhan's book, The Mechanical Bride, which concentrated on the form of advertising. This concentrates on the content. Both are necessary in understanding the brain police. Um, so as um, they got more used to my presence, they gradually got to know me as Paul Buff, and I introduced them to some of the most advanced technologies in studio recording and in entertainment, Hollywood recording. And that gave Frank an edge on everybody, and he took my studio over. Actually, he was there in 1963, but officially he took it over in 1964. And we had just been visiting that studio in the section of this videotape before this videotape. So refer back to that for what happened at Studio Z. So um, this is an homage to Frank and Don here at, at uh, Lancaster, California. We have just returned from Briarwood Estates where uh, Don used to live with his mother. And uh, we had a wonderful evening with Sue Van Vliet, Sue Vliet in her terms. And um, she was very happy to see me again. She said, Paul, I haven't seen you in 19 years. That's right, it was 19 years, since 77. And she said, Paul, I remember the days when you'd come over here. The night, the early mornings, I'd come into the kitchen, and my husband would just be getting into the bread truck, and there'd be you, Don, and Frank. 
And I always remember, she said this tonight, I always remember you, you kept talking about UFOs to them. And I thought it was rather strange. They didn't know what to think. But it looks like, Bob, as a result of the crop circles in England, that you were right. And I will forever be grateful to you to initiating my child and his friend into the mysteries of the universe before they became obvious mysteries. And that's what she said to us tonight. Didn't she say that, Connie? Scott? And Jerry? Yes. So that's why after visiting Mrs. Fleet, we are here now ending our journey on the 46th anniversary, no, the 41st anniversary, which is the obverse of 14. And we came to Lancaster by a Route 14. And the 41st anniversary of Hiroshima, we are here to anticipate the end of the end times in two years, July 5th, 1998. So this is it, August 6th, 1996. A lot of sixes there. We were even phoning a person while we are coming out here <laughs> whose, whose phone number has 666 in it. The synchrony is it forever burdening me. It's not the white man's burden, it's Bob man's burden. The synchrony of constant linguistic communication and mirroring back to Bob what he continually creates. Uh, did we have any particular synchrony? Uh, oh yes, we uh, passed by Claremont College. Colleges of Claremont? What was it? Claremont College. Claremont, and colleges of Claremont, or Claremont College, and there it was, the uh, main stomping grounds of Peter Drucker, the man who, who brought over Fritz Kramer, and Fritz Kramer was the person who invented Kissinger, and now Peter Drucker, according to our sources, is the main consultant to uh, the Newt Gingrich contract on America. Well, we passed by there, and right in the front entrance to this campus, you see the words Dartmouth Avenue. And so the mirror of language tells us that Dartmouth, where I spent many years, was symbolically monitoring Peter Drucker for the final battle of the Secret Council 10 in 1988. And it was uh, me from Dartmouth who sent the information to May, Bru to May Brussels that cracked the case on Fritz Kramer thanks to uh, Peter Drucker's autobiography. So therefore, in the course of coming here to see Sue in Lancaster, we discovered that Dartmouth was haunting, that name was haunting Mr. Drucker at Claremont College for, let's say, 50 years. 40 years, anyways. I think he arrived there in the 60s. So there it was, Dartmouth Avenue. Every day he walked under that street sign, not knowing that 30 years later it would, <laughs> it would synchronize with his uh, colluding of, of recapitulating the fact that success is no failure at all. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, is oh. uh, <laughs> more? What about Newt on the lawn? Newt? Oh, do, oh I do mean, on the Newt. Let's all remember and, and, that what was the, the main our encounter with? Did we just talked to Ray and Newt's on the lawn connection? Right. You're thinking of 200 motels. And, the, and there's the train. It's the old train that Don and Frank used to listen to while they listened to race records out of Mexico and uh, maybe maybe Wolfman Jack, but probably before Wolfman Jack. What's your problem? Anyways, anyways the lonesome train that Don and Frank remembered from the 30s and the songs and culture of the blacks, the Native Americans, the uh, black Americans, the African Americans, the the black Amer the Americans who looked like they were black but were real Americans and didn't have to put a hyphen name in front of them. These people were who entertained Frank and prepared him for the encounter for the ultimate black woman, me, Bob Dobbs, occasionally known as Paul Buff. Now, the interesting, <laughs> this, see, Frank predicted, in his anachrony, he predicted Bob's anachrony, because in 200 Motels, one of the major, major mystery themes is newts. Newts are running amok in 200 Motels. So he linguistically, musically, predicted the main syllable of the 90s, as he sings in 1980, 1988 in Broadway Hardway, when will he, singing about whether Pat Robertson will be president, he's going, will he be president 92, 96? I sure hope Frank says that he doesn't, or will he? Anyways, <clears throat> here it is, 96, and uh, Pat Robertson's extension, Mr. Newt, is running amok in America, and it was predicted in the movie 200 Motels. Newt, now, you, could you elaborate on the Newt theme? Or what do you know about the Newt theme in 200 Motels in particular? I thought it was Newt's on the lawn, or what's right. the song? He was Motorhead. Well, was it Motorhead playing with the Newt's? Yeah. There was a Newt. Who? Newt. Who Motorhead played with he the Newt. Play, he played, well, he wasn't the Newt. He had the, 
the pilot yeah. hat on. Yeah. There was a new. Maybe it's Dick Barber who was yeah. the new. Yeah. No, he was the industrial vacuum cleaner. There, anyways, there were anonymous newts in the movie. And isn't that amazing that the newts were into our motels, and it was that word that plagues America in the 90s, Newt Gingrich. Oh. Oh, what? Ooh. <laughs> Doesn't come with a warning label. Baskin Robbins, Chocolate Blast, yet. Okay, I'm Newt. I think that's the hidden point of Newt. Frank predicted it in his own musical collage. Right? Right. <laughs> that's it. Preferential, Frank's work uh, predicting Bob's actual physical existence and what he has in his daily life of uh, cultural interchange. Oh, assassination attempt! <laughs> <laughs> That's it with that. <laughs> she's either drunk or she's getting very, getting the point. <laughs> How are you going to explain to the throngs of masses? Connie's laughing in the background of this serious uh, conference. And yeah, when this gets broadcast. How am I going to explain to them? Yeah, have I ever been asked to explain myself? World. No. They don't even let me back on to explain myself. This is always a one-time shoot. <laughs> but what, what are you asking? Well, how am I going to explain what? Well, yeah, as, as millions of people begin to understand what's really going on via Bob. Bob's prediction. They hear Connie laughing in the background. How's Bob going to explain the laughter? Well, when Carol, I was giving out new information. When so you're Carol, laughing, you're learning. Carol was learning, <laughs> learning new stuff. <laughs> but the amazing thing is, is that what are they going to say about what Sue Vliet going to say? Mm, yes, I do remember Bob visiting you. I, when they interview you, she'll say, "Yes, I remember." That is all true. You watch. I Slack works for me all the time. So uh, that was pretty good, right? Yeah. But you see how it's Bob's too. After it was London Bob, then it was Bob too. How did I like that? So we came all the way out here. Well, that was good. Oh, we came and this. Actually, we caught Bob lying for the first time in his life. <laughs> uh, end time day, August 6th. I actually lied about meeting Sue Lee, right? <laughs> but it was a means to an end, so we say. I <laughs> And people, everybody who drove by was laughing. Did you notice? They were all like, they picked up something going on here. Did wave at them? Yeah. Did he wave back? Yeah. Oh. We'll never know until we find out when Sue Fleet died, whether that fucking manager was lying to us or not. Did you get that on tape? Yeah. Well, erase that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're not telling what they're lying about. But we'll never know until we find out whether Sue Fleet has died or not, whether we were lied to. Let's go. Thank you.